All right, now, this one's a little dusty, boy. This one needs a little bit of a cleaning, but this is a Rolleiflex, I think this is a 2.8C. It's got a Zenitar 80 millimeter 2.8 lens. You pay more for these with the 2.8 lens, and I'm not sure that it's worth it. The half a stop that you gain, you get a much larger lens physically, and it's weighty. It's weighty. It adds more weight to the camera. So this is a camera that I picked up that I'll probably end up selling because it actually has some film transport problems. It doesn't transport evenly when I shoot film in it. And I need a camera, of course, that I can trust if I'm shooting 120 film in it. But it's a camera that I would highly recommend for a small package that you can carry a 120 camera in your bag without a lot of weight and there's no batteries needed for the meter or for the shutter. It's all mechanical. So this is a uh, 2.8 C. It's got that Zenitar lens, which is considered an equivalent to the planer by Carl Zeiss, which they make. It's got a nice viewfinder. And I like a waist level viewfinder because I think that there's something interesting about the fact that you're composing with both eyes open, yet you're holding the camera in a waist level position where you have a good sense of you know control over the body and you're not going to shake it. As opposed to using a viewfinder on a phone where you're holding it out at arm's length, that's really a difficult way to photograph and get sharp pictures. But this works really well because it's at your waist, you're looking down into it, and with both eyes you're seeing a photograph that's about to be made as opposed to one eye looking through a viewfinder. So that's my biggest thing about using a waist level Rolleiflex plus the fact that you're not looking at the people that you're photographing, it gives them a little bit of a sense of that you're not actually maybe even photographing them. And it's a great way to shoot street if you want to shoot with a 120. So when you get, get a Rolleiflex, check to make sure the focus is smooth. I've had some where as you focus it, I could feel like little bumps in the, in the, in the focus, like something's been banged up a little bit. That's something that you don't want. You want it to be nice and smooth. When you shoot it, it's got a little lock here that prevents you from shooting it and open it up and try it. You can hear the shutter. Then you wind it and then you wind it back to reset the shutter. This has a 50th of a second it's set on, so that should sound like a 50th. You might be able to see it. Again, you roll it to about here and you roll it back and when it stops, you're reset. Um, I can get these in there a little tight. Here's a half a second. Let's see if the exposures seem like they're right on. That was a half a second. That felt a little bit on the long side for a half a second, but we'll see. Half a second? That felt like a second. So the shutter speeds on the slow part of the lens, on the slow part of the shutter, are a little bit on the slow side. But how often do you really shoot at a half a second that you really need to worry about that? The thing that matters more is if you're shooting at, here's a 25th of a second. This is written in the old nomenclature instead of a 30th. This should sound a little faster. And that sounded like it. That sounded like I would trust it. It's working as a uh, 25th of a second. And then I'm betting most of the time I'm shooting up here at 250. And that sounds completely right for me. Again, film is pretty forgiving. Don't worry about the uh, camera being 100% accurate. Usually they need a cleaning lube and adjustment to make them exactly right. And I put that money into film and I'll learn how a camera works and I'll add a little bit of exposure time or a little bit of development time if it's something that seems like it needs more to get the right exposure as opposed to putting the money into cleaning. The cleaning can set you back 125 to $200 usually. Um, Again, I like the camera. It's well built. It's got a little flip up magnifier so that you can use that to magnify the ground glass and see critical focus. It's got a uh, little doodad. You can push this down and you can actually look through a little window here 
and you can look at it like you're looking through a little window, like a tunnel. I don't think I've ever used that, or nor would I really want to, but I like, uh, you know, that it has it. Now get that to go back down. Okay, now it's back down. Okay, so let's close this up a second. And then uh, I check the back when I buy one of these. This has the opening right here. You open it with that little doodad there. And then uh, you pull that down. And that lets you pull this open. And then you can look inside. You can see it looks rather clean because most of these are really, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of uh, time spent unopened. So they usually stay pretty clean. It's got a plate back here that you can shift into two positions. One for 120 film and one for 220 film. I only use 120 film, and I think Kodak just discontinued 220 film real recently. Um, there's a take-up spool. If you don't have one, you can pick up one off any roll of film. Every time you use a roll of film, you get a new take-up spool. And the back of the lens looks pretty good. It doesn't look like it's... If I can get it to show up. It doesn't look like it's uh, scratched in any way. It looks pretty clean. I don't know that I can show that to you. But it does look really clean in the back. And... Again, everything seems to be working. You can check focus again, make sure that the lens is moving in and out, and it is. These little spools are just for the, the reels. There's one below here and there's one up here. And there's a film counter if you want to use 35 millimeter film in here. I don't really see any reason to do that. If you're buying this camera, you're buying it, I think, to use 120 film. So they made a little adapter because when these cameras were made, people started getting into 35 millimeter and they thought, well, if we have a 35 millimeter adapter, we could make it so that people could use this camera. I have seen some people are modifying a little spool to make it so that they can run 35 millimeter film just down the center. Again, I don't really have an interest in that. If I'm shooting this camera, I want to shoot 120 images. I want to make photographs with a large negative and it's a beautiful, beautiful negative that it makes. So to close it back up, you just kind of push it and then this pulls this lever back and it locks it up. Um, here's a terminal for flash sync if you're using an external flash. Again, I'm a purist when it comes to film photography. I like to use natural light or bring other kinds of natural light to the scene, like maybe an extra lamp or a softbox. But continuous light I use a lot. And again, this is a uh, pretty basic, small, handheld camera that you can keep with you all the time. It weighs a little bit. It will, you will notice it if you put it in your bag, but it's not like it's something that is such a big system camera, like a Mamiya 330 or a 220. Or an RV67 is certainly, you know, three of these combined in weight. They made an amazing package in this camera in making a camera that could have so much quality as far as engineering and lens quality and transport in such a small little box. So the Roloflex I highly recommend. I would go for a 3.5F or a, a T. Those are good Roloflexes. There's a lot of different models and they are all conversation pieces, you'll meet a lot of people when you shoot a roll of flux because a lot of people are interested in what kind of camera is that. You can do some things like you can hold it over your head and look up into the ground glass viewfinder and get over the crowd shots. You can hold it down low and people won't notice it so much. If you look up Vivian Meyer, Vivian M-A-I-E-R, she shot all her photographs well, not all, but a lot, with a Roloflex, and you'll see she's kind of a famous photographer. Now, her work has been found, after she died, they found her work in a storage locker. She shot a lot of film in a Roloflex in the 40s and 50s and 60s and never developed them. And now, she's considered a master. And I really enjoy her work, so take a look if you get a chance. That's the Roloflex. This is a 2.8C, if you get one, Take it and run a roll of test film through it to make sure you don't have transport problems. This one has a little bit of a transport problem. And I look forward to seeing what you have to show me. Show me some of your pictures because, you know, it all comes back down to what are we making with these cameras. All right. Thanks for tuning in. That's the Roloflex. Looking forward to seeing you next time for the next camera review. Talk to you soon.